And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Great to have on today, Professor Sean O'Neill from Hanover College. Sean, how are you doing today? Doing well, thanks. How are you? Doing great. And uh, looking forward to this particular episode is, in a sense, a postscript to our series on the book of Daniel, digging in specifically into the date of Daniel and the reliability of Daniel. Uh, We talked throughout the series about the importance of prophecy and just how rich the book is with historical um, facts. And so I wanted to bring on an expert uh, from that time period to to dig into that issue. And I'll explain in a minute uh, just exactly why I think this is so important for us as Christians in kind of day-to-day interactions with other believers, as well as in just a, a certainty in our own faith. So I wanted to start, um, so I'm with just a few of your credentials. He's the uh, professor of classical studies, and he's, he's um, told me that that, that means that he's not talk, talking about Bach or Beethoven, but rather ancient history, all right? Uh, bachelor's at the University of Michigan, uh, master's and PhD at the University of, of Cincinnati. He's been teaching at Hanover College since uh, 2011 in classical studies. So that's archaeology, language, literature, history of the ancient Mediterranean world. He's published scholarship on topics ranging from archaeological side of Troy to the art and archaeology of Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt. And then he, he has a focus in ancient language and literature, uh, literature studies. He's worked on texts in Latin, Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, hieroglyphic Egyptian, and Demotic Egyptian. And uh, Sean's a humble guy. When I asked him, because one of our mutual friends said that he knows over 100 languages, he just kind of quipped that, hey, I can, oh, I can really, I can only read and write 11 <laughs> languages, which I about snorted my coffee at, at that moment, because that's 10 more than most of us, right? <laughs> and so, Sean, thank you for, for taking a moment um, to jump in. Anything that I might have missed there with some of your uh, credentials and your focus over there at Hanover College? No, uh, I do appreciate that very kind introduction and a very thorough introduction. It might be noteworthy that my degree at the doctorate level is actually in Bronze Age and Classical Archaeology, uh, which means, of course, that I dig up old things in the dirt. Uh, now, my great Aunt Emma would say that archaeologists are the ones who dig up dinosaur bones, but I've tried to explain to her many times, we're the ones who dig up things that have been fashioned or altered by human hands. We leave the dinosaur bones to the paleontologists. They wear shorts and the funny hats. We never wear shorts as archaeologists, and our hats are much, much cooler. Okay. <laughs> we're going to have to have a lineup here. Uh, it's And that fascinates me. In fact, if I had not become an attorney, there was a time in my life I was thinking archaeology would be such a fascinating career. And I know that you spend time in the Middle East digging up old stuff <laughs> and <laughs> studying it, but directly relevant to what we've talked about throughout the series, the Daniel Manual, in the sense that especially over the last couple hundred years, there have been increasing attacks on the authenticity of Scripture, the reliability of Scripture, and specifically in for the book of Daniel. And if you've been following along in the Daniel manual, we've talked about how, for example, in Daniel 11, 135 perfectly fulfilled prophecies dating from something like, if we take a 6th century date, like 530 BC to something like 167 BC. So like 360 years. So to try to just give an example, uh, imagine, you know, think of the United States as something like 245 years old. You imagine George Washington setting out in a letter, like the exact details of a world war that would occur like a hundred years past our time. And it just coming perfectly to pass. Certainly only God could do that. And we talked about in, in the the series that, you know, there's a God, God spoke to Daniel, Daniel leaks arms with the prophets. They all point to Jesus. So I look at the book of Daniel, like all scripture is important, but certainly the book of Daniel can be kind of a link in the chain of uh, our belief in the authority of, of scripture. And Sean, we talked about this in, uh, a brief time that we had to share at Cornerstone at my church, but that if you Google the book of Daniel, like the date of Daniel, and say you're you're talking to a coworker, like, look at all this amazing prophecy. It points to Jesus Christ. It points to the authority of scripture. Uh, the first result that's going to pop up is from Wikipedia, and it's going to simply say that the book of Daniel was written in the second century, making everything I just described, all of that prophecy, history. So like that, whoever was writing it was just kind of picking up a book and, and writing it after the fact. So this becomes a really important conversation and one that I think we need to be equipped to answer. And as 
Uh, Sean and I were, were talking about this issue over coffee. It just struck me. Hey, everybody needs to know about this. We really need this information to support and strengthen our faith. And so with that said, let's let's dig right in on that date of Daniel. As I mentioned there, we believe historically Daniel writing in the 6th century. That makes everything in the book prophecy. Um and for most of Daniel's existence, the book's existence, it was unquestioned. There was an individual named Porphyry back in the 300s AD that kind of questioned it. But then it was in the 17 to 1800s with higher criticism that began questioning this date of Daniel. Uh, so the big question is, was it written in the 6th century, which would be the historical approach, the approach that I believe is correct, or was it written in the 2nd? Was it kind of written after the fact? And so I'll kind of hand the baton off to you. Uh, Professor O'Neill, what are your thoughts on the date of Daniel? Well, it's a uh, it's an issue that has several different angles from which you can approach it, and I think that the primary angles that uh, well that can be used in support of a sixth century BC date uh, answer some of the questions that scholars, both Christian scholars and non Christian scholars. Have, have brought to bear challenges about the date, the attempt to downdate it, as you noted, to the second century BC, which um, is now the majority view uh, to the extent that, as you said, you look at Wikipedia and you can track the changes on Wikipedia. Uh, so there's been an evolution there. Uh, at first, there was no mention of the date in the opening blurb for the book of Daniel. Then uh, for many years, it was sixth century BC or second century BC. And now uh, this most commonly used online source says simply the second century BC. And the, the basis for that has been a combination of the doubting of the prophecy, yes, but also there's been a wave of attack against the authenticity of a contemporaneous Book of Daniel, that is to say, placing it within the Babylonian captivity and the um, era right around the sixth century BC. Um, the, the more recent history, which does go back a couple hundred years, of attacks against Daniel have been rooted mainly in the linguistic sphere, in addition to this denial of the prophetic. And the linguistic arguments on the Hebrew side of the ledger go all the way back, in fact, to the 19th century. Um, and on the Aramaic side of the ledger to the early 20th century, right around the 1920s. And it's a um, it's complex, of course, because, as you know, and as I'm sure you've shared with your podcast audience, there are four distinct languages that are represented in the book of Daniel. But a vast majority of what's there textually, as you add up the lines, is, of course, Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, on the Hebrew side of the ledger, the linguistic argument is an interesting one. It, 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 it makes me smile simply because... Uh, for the overall style, the grammar, the syntax, there's nothing that can really bring it down to a second century BC date. And those who look at that aspect of the structure of the Hebrew say, well, of course they're writing in an archaic style because of the material, the content, what they're writing about, the subgenre, et cetera, et cetera. And so they justify the fact that this is perfectly acceptable sixth century BC Hebrew by saying, well, the author, this later author, must be writing in a, this highfalutin, archaic style for a reason. In addition to that, they, they look at a handful of roots and words that didn't exist in the corpus. And it's not that we have a, a massive library full of 6th century BC Hebrew. They just say, looking at the, the surviving corpus that we have, we don't see these individual words. And it really is just a handful of words. I won't say a handful of roots because there are roots that are attested in earlier Hebrew that maybe not in the exact form of a noun or an adjective, as the case may be, um, existed in that previous body of surviving Hebrew. So what we're talking about ultimately on the Hebrew side of the ledger is saying, well, there's just, there's a few, hand, a few words, a handful of roots. And because we don't see them in the earlier corpus, this must be second century BC. Well, they can't make the argument that strong. They can't really say must, but they try to push it in that direction on a variation of what is essentially an argument from silence, which, as you know, is an argumentative fallacy. On the Aramaic side of the ledger, it's 
It's another case of looking at a few individual words when, in fact, the surviving corpus is much smaller. Biblical Hebrew, there just isn't much that's there in the first place. And it's a weird dialect because it looks forward and backwards at the same time in all of the bits that we have, including Ezra. There's a little bit in Jeremiah. There just isn't much to go on. But here's the bottom line of the Aramaic side of the ledger, and that is that the Aramaic of Daniel really does correspond in just about every regard with so-called imperial Aramaic. It's a controversial label, but imperial Aramaic is the Aramaic that survives at epigraphic evidence and official inscriptions and communications and stelae, et cetera, um, that are produced right from the governmental authority and exist in the epigraphic record from, oh, say about 700 to 300 BC. Yes, it's true that there are some elements of biblical Hebrew that seem to presage uh, an evolution of the Aramaic language. But as I said, by and large, biblical Hebrew falls in line. And there was a wonderful PhD dissertation that was published through Trinity Evangelical um, that went you know, in a very systematic structure by structure, even word by word mode of analysis to demonstrate that, yes, yeah, sure enough, this could correspond to uh, the Aramaic that was commonly used from 700 to about 300 BC. And sure, it's true that Semitic languages, like all other languages, evolve over time, but they don't evolve in such a way that you can look at something like biblical Hebrew, or sorry, biblical Aramaic and say, well, this is clearly a later version of the language that's closer to what Jesus and his contemporaries would have spoken themselves, as opposed to the Aramaic that was in use in the 6th century BC. And so just for those that may be joining us for the first time for this particular episode, or it's been a little while since we covered some of this, the basic argument being, and Professor O'Neill can correct me if I'm, I'm misstating this, but that languages essentially evolve over time. And we use the example of if you had a letter from George Washington, I keep coming back to him for some reason, but he, he has a letter talking about an iPad. Well, we're all like, well, the iPad didn't exist in the Revolutionary War, so this must have been introduced after the fact. And in Daniel, you have kind of an opening chapter, but then two through approximately seven in Aramaic, the common language of the Gentiles. And, and I love the concept that this wasn't just like Aramaic, but the term like imperial Aramaic, uh, the type that might have been used by royalty. And and well, well who does Daniel purport to be in the book? It, it matches there. And then from uh, kind of eight on, um, going back into Hebrew, and we talked about the reasons for the division of the book, but the, the critics basically saying, well, it, there's no way it could have been written in the sixth century because all the language is the more, more evolved, you know, later language. But what I'm hearing you say is that, no, there's there's certainly an argument to be made. This this is the type of language that could have been used in the sixth century. So if you're looking, you know, biblical critic for the knockout blow to say Daniel is no good, you know, was written in the second, that linguistic evidence just doesn't stack up. Um, in that way. It's kind of how I, I was framing or thinking through the argument. Yeah, I think I think you're right on the money, uh, with the exception that it's not that they say all the language must be from a later time, just snippets of language. Okay. And, and these arguments ultimately are tenuous at best. It's a, a difficult case to make in the first place, but even threading, to, as you look at the thread of indirect evidence and these strands, do they pull enough together to really hold some weight as I said, it's arguable and tenuous at the very best, but you certainly can't use the linguistic evidence to say, well, clearly, here is a book that was written much later than the 6th century BC. So you mentioned the Aramaic, you mentioned um, Hebrew, but would you touch just briefly on the Persian and the Greek? I was also interested by that. Sure, the, the Persian, there's, there's su such little Persian that you really can't say one way or the other and there and you know you get some proper nouns in there those don't really change over time anyway uh and so there's not much to say on that front the greek however is interesting and again there's not an overwhelming amount but the the snippets that are there once again you certainly can't say it's it's late Hellenistic Greek. Um, if anything, you could look at those snippets of Greek and say, well, no, this is really 
what we know as classical Greek. Now, I know that that label can apply to the entirety of the ancient Mediterranean world, but when I say classical in regard to the Greek language, I'm talking about the Greek that was commonly used in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, where, where so many of our surviving texts uh, derive from. Uh, all of those great dramas of Aristophanes and Sophocles and Euripides, the philosophical works of Plato, so on and so forth. So it, it's struck me that the the basic argument is there's no way, especially these Greek musical instruments could have ended up in the Babylonian lexicon. But from what I've looked at, I mean, there were Greek mercenaries, uh, there were Greek slaves, and there's a verse in, I believe, Psalms that talks about how we sat down next to the river of Babylon and wept, and they asked them for a song. So it seems like there might have been part of Babylonian culture that was interested in the art and maybe music of other other cultures, other ethnicities. And so, again, it's basically if the argument is, all right, these words are there, there's a Greek instrument there that you, you claim there's no way that the Babylonians could have known about it. Well, actually, there is possibility they would have known about it. So if you're looking for the knockout punch to the book of Daniel, it's just not stacking up to be that. We also... Yeah, so uh, go ahead. I would say what you're getting into at that point is an argument about material culture. Also, you're talking about artifacts that would have been known um, in Babylon. And you're right when you say that on the Greek side of the ledger, that there was a, I won't say a diaspora, but there was certainly a, a crop of Greeks who ended up throughout the North Africa and the Near East and the Middle East in context that most people don't imagine as a first thought. You mentioned one when you said mercenary soldiers uh, being spread all over the Near East, the Middle East, and Egypt, very notably, um, who were of Greek descent, right? Who are ethnic, folks who are ethnically Greek. At that time, that's defined by somebody whose first language is Greek. If you're able to speak Greek, well then, ethnically, you are Greek. And um, and that's just one of several beyond colonization, beyond merchants. And believe me, there were plenty of folks who fell into those categories who were of Greek ethnicity, who spread throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. And you know, a lot of folks think, you, you know, basic classical history, they think that it was only with the um, conquest of Alexander the Great that Greek language and culture spread throughout those parts of the world. But in fact, there's ample evidence, including archaeological evidence, that demonstrates that knowledge of all of these Greek arts, the material culture, spread well before then. One that just comes to mind, now this would have been after the Babylonian period, but in the Persian period where the Greek Xenophon, I think, takes about 10,000 soldiers in a Persian civil war. Uh, the guy they're supporting ends up dead, and then they have to hoof it out of Persia because they're on the wrong side. And, and that's a fascinating greed as they are marching back to the sea. So that was just, if you've read uh, some of that history, that just is one example of what, that came to mind. We, we also talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how uh, the discovery of those scrolls, again, not maybe conclusive evidence, but certainly evidence that highlights what we've been talking about here concerning language and the 6th century date. Yes, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are, I mean, obviously, uh, for those who know of them, they are a spectacular find, both archaeologically, linguistically, those interested in textual history. It, is, it was just a treasure trove, truly. And for those who aren't quite familiar with that discovery, um, the the series of documents in the area of Qumran, not too far away from the Dead Sea, um, hence the label, uh, were written upon a few different materials, parchment, papyrus, uh, largely, and even an example of some work on copper. Now, those texts date from variously from the third century BC down to about the first century AD. It's a collection, and in some of those texts are older than others. Now, scholars have been working ever since their discovery in trying to date the series of texts and to put them into groups, if you will, um, that perform, yes, not just a textual sequence and saying, okay, well, this belongs to this part of the Bible, this belongs to this 
snippet of, of uh, something that's canonical. This is something that's non-canonical, but also, and more or less crucially for this argument, in terms of date, you know, what material is third century BC date? What's second century? What's first century? So on and so forth. And what's fascinating is, and I remember when I was in graduate school, I remember seeing an article in a book chapter that had a rather stark title that drew the attention. And it said, the title was something like, the book of Daniel, colon, confirmed via the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and the, the essence of the argument there was one that was rather fascinating from my perspective. And that is that there are portions of, Dan of the book of Daniel that are among the Dead Sea Scrolls that are from the earliest dated texts of that cache of the discovery, which is to say that it's third century BC material for these fragments of Daniel, therefore predating the quote unquote history of the second century BC. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore the prophetic aspect of Daniel is now preserved. It, it's now supported, which uh, was a significant discovery at the time, obviously. Uh, that is an article uh, or a chapter, I can't remember which, but I, I do know that it probably deserves wider circulation in that it was very systematic, very well done. And it does show uh, that those portions of the Dead Sea Scrolls lend a pre-2nd century BC date for Daniel a bit of weight. And this fascinated me because you have essentially these Daniel fragments lumped in with scrolls from you know pr prior to second century so you have older scrolls and then daniel's kind of lumped into it and it's a copy so you you mm -hmm. can assume that well if the copy's there it must have been written prior to this in time for there to be some some copy there so I, that was just one one last piece of evidence that fascinated me and i think again if you're it, it's more along the lines if you're looking for the knockout punch uh, to take Daniel out, and and you want to be able to say this couldn't. There's no way this could be supernatural. There's no way this could be the authority. You know, lends weight to the authority of scripture. This linguistic argument argument is just not it. It it doesn't provide that knockout punch. And and so we talked through before during the this series that there are a few arguments against Daniel. Um, things like linguistics, which we just covered. Um, the fact that there's prophecy, and it's I find that kind of a circular argument. Well, prophecy is not possible. Well, why is that the case? Because we don't believe in the supernatural. Like, okay, that's kind of kind of circular there. But then also this idea of you know it's in the wrong section of the Bible, or um, that the theology is too advanced, specifically the theology concerning the resurrection. And like, yeah, read read Job, you know, read Genesis. And so I think. The the two most critical challenges to Daniel are number one the linguistic piece of it, and you've spoken to that. I so appreciate just your perspective and the background that you have on this. I have found it personally just really encouraging to my faith, especially as I was finishing up the series. Uh, but then the second one, of course, is the the claims of historical blunders. And and so, what are your thoughts on the historical reliability of the Book of Daniel? And we'll we'll talk about the two specific characters. One being uh, Belshazzar. Now, uh, listeners, please, you have to, and I said this at our church as well, um, there's a little bit of nervousness here. Like I'm speaking to an ancient linguist, and I'm sure I've been like butchering ancient Babylonian all along. Uh, so Professor O'Neill can correct me on those pronunciations. Uh, but then, so Belshazzar, but then also Darius the Mede, who we've talked about. So kind of open-ended question there. I'll uh, just jump into what what are your thoughts on the historical reliability of the book? Sure. I, I think that history and archaeology go hand in hand in, in regard to this book. And uh, I'll start by, by talking about a historical figure that you didn't mention, and that is Nebuchadnezzar II. And, and of course, there are no historians who dispute the, the, his reign, the date of his reign, etc., the sequencing of his reign. And Nebuchadnezzar II was known for, is known for, this, uh, the, the prosperity, essentially, the prosperity that came for the Babylonians uh, under strong centralized rule, which he certainly oversaw. And that prosperity was renowned uh, throughout the Middle East, throughout the Near East, even the Greeks knew of his, uh, what he was able to accomplish 
And one of his historic and archaeological achievements was to transform Babylon, essentially, to transform the city itself and to build on a level in terms of monumental architecture that hadn't been seen there um, other than the, the central ziggurat. But the, the fact remains that the archaeological impact that he had and some of the historical associations of what he was able to accomplish, it, they're all traceable and they're all confirmable. And one of those happens to be his, uh, and this will seem a much less uh, glamorous than the Hanging Gardens, which were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which were attributed to his reign, but of which no trace survives, of course. Um, but that's true of six of those seven wonders, as it turns out. But one thing that we can trace that is also noted is, is the opulence of the monumental architecture. And that opulence is referred to at various points of the Book of Daniel, references to some bits of architecture, the palace structures. There's that gold uh, image that is set up, which can only be done in a wealthy empire, obviously, drawing on many resources. But in terms of the historical impact that's also traceable in the archaeological record, his transformation of bricks, and again, this I, I didn't say that this was going to be particularly sexy, but for archaeologists, this is noteworthy. <laughs> and, and that is that instead of using the typical sun-dried mud brick for the construction of architecture in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was able to usher in a wave of construction that used a much more expensive brick making technique. And that is kiln fired brick. And now we're dealing with what is technically ceramic, right? Rather than something that in a temperate climate is going to simply slowly waste away uh, due to the ravages of time. Well, ceramic kiln fired brick survives in the archeological record. Stone and brick of that sort are something that we can trace in phases, even when later construction phases are built upon them. And that's significant in this case, because the transformation that Nebuchadnezzar ushered in, in within Babylon is something that is traceable in the archaeological record, and that folks in the second century BC would not have been able to see firsthand, with again, that possible exception of the central ziggurat. And that's because of uh, the Persian takeover, later phases of the city, um, and so this contemporaneous description of what Nebuchadnezzar had achieved architecturally and the opulence of the empire that, again, wouldn't have been visible all those centuries later. This is something else that I think pushes us a bit towards a 6th century BC date, that we, we actually take the narrator of the first half and Daniel in the second half at their word and say, okay, they're writing about this time um, in Babylon, and, well, we can date it to that time. The the two figures that you mentioned now um, yeah. are also mentioned. Oh, please, Sorry, go ahead. To, yeah, I just want to jump in before I, I lost this thought. I I wanted to just remind listeners about Daniel chapter number four. And we talked about this at length in the sermon where Nebuchadnezzar goes out on his palace roof and he's, you know, look at the Babylon that I have built. It, this is exactly the Nebuchadnezzar, as you're saying, that we find in the record. And we talked about something like 15 million. I may have that number off a bit. Uh, bricks, these kiln fired bricks stamped, I believe, with his own name. Like, you know, just in case anybody wonders, like, who built this? It was me. And uh, some of the ziggurats in Babylon, the, the Ishtar Gate, um, all of these amazing wonders. And, and it's at that moment, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's like, mine, mine, mine. And then he's, you know, Mui, he, he turns into this animal. But this is exactly the Nebuchadnezzar we find in the record. Uh, there were two, two points on, on this um, issue that I was interested by. One was the blue of the the gate at Babylon, I thought maybe that was locally sourced or they were able to use some sort of chemical. Um, but then also that you have a theory, and I'd heard this previously, but that the fiery furnace may have had something to do with these kiln fired bricks. Would you speak to those two issues? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned the blue of the Ishtar gate. Now that is something that possibly was visible even in later generations. And, and I'm sure that folks both in Nebuchadnezzar's own time and in later centuries were amazed by it. And one of the astounding features of that, and it one something that shows the extent of the reach of the empire, is that that blue, in fact, could only be sourced 
from quite a distance away. And, and so the, the inlaid portion uh, of the Ishtar Gate, right, in that striking blue, wasn't something that could be locally produced or, or sourced. And therefore, it had to be brought from quite a distance away. The, um, there's, a, there's some vivid yellow, too, some vivid gold coloring there that's also likewise uh, a reflection of just ostentatious wealth being on display for all those who are coming into that entrance of uh, what's already a massive and striking city uh, by the time Nebuchadnezzar's reign is finished. And, and then you mentioned uh, as well um, the, the fiery furnace itself and how that might relate to this wave, this brand new wave of architectural construction, monumental architecture under Nebuchadnezzar. And this hypothesis that the fiery furnace may have been a rather large scale brick kiln is something I, I certainly can't argue against. In fact, I, I think that hypothesis holds a bit of water uh, especially when you think, well, for what purpose would a large furnace have existed in the first place in, at that time? And the, the logical answer is, well, it was for the production of these many millions, as you noted earlier, many millions of kiln-fired bricks. And so I just thought that was fascinating. It brings some uh, additional context for these stories that we've many of us have heard since we first attended church, perhaps as kids. Uh, so I found that fascinating. I'll let you move on now to some of these historical characters. Yes. So uh, the the character or the figure of Baal Shazar, as he, his name would have been um, in his own language, that 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 now is, of course, not so controversial as it was perhaps oh, 100 years ago. And um, as you know, if you wait long enough, sometimes you'll you'll see things turn up in the archaeological record that shed some light on individual characters, events, etc., that may have been doubted in the past, but that in fact confirm their existence. Very often this happens to the advantage of biblical text. Sometimes it's the text of the Greek historians or uh, writings and observations in, in other parts of the Mediterranean world. And, and this happened in the case, as, as you know, I'm sure, of Baal Shazar. And uh, so he is no longer a controversial figure, thanks to some um, seal stones, some other uh, artifacts that, that bear a testament to his reign. But the, I think the most mysterious figure, and the one you mentioned earlier, who's still a great question mark for all uh, biblical scholars, historians, etc., is Darius the Mede. And to be honest, I can't answer the question about Darius the Mede. Um, what I can say is that for those of us who believe in the contemporaneity of Daniel, we, we say thank you for, for mentioning this figure we didn't know before. Thank you for, prevent, for presenting us with this wonderful mystery, uh, even though it creates questions that are not easy to answer. And, you know, there are several ideas about who this may have been. Was it a co-regent who doesn't get mentioned in other uh, historical sources, especially Greek historical sources like Herodotus? Um, due to oversight to be or or is it somebody who's been conflated with another king maybe the third king in the line of median kings is it the general who came and oversaw the conquest of babylon somebody whose name gobrias could easily be transposed to darius um in in textual uh history we we don't know and i don't have a firm answer for you but what i can say is this the mentioning of, of Darius the Mede in Daniel in no way can be counted as some sort of massive strike against it as far as historical authenticity is concerned. As I said, the other way to look at it is to say, well, here's a source among our very few sources that mentioned this era of kingship and the passage of power in this part of the world in the first place. So there are there are several ways to look at that, but I, I certainly would not put too much stock in, for example, the account of Herodotus himself, since Herodotus' own methodology is simply to report what he's heard from people he's interviewed, whether we're talking about record keepers and archives, priests, priestesses, folks on the street. He's very honest about his methods, and he simply relays what he's being told by some local folk and nothing more than that. A couple of follow-ups there. One being that, uh, as you mentioned, 
at our church, you actually teach a class on Herodotus. I found I found that fascinating. Um, and so you know firsthand kind of his, his methods. But the the question of, well, who was Darius the Mede? Uh, we talked in the series about, you know, Xenophon and Josephus have a theory that he's this uh, median co-regent and uh, a perhaps, he, a perhaps named Siaxres the second by the Greeks. And then we went through kind of all of the other theories that you you mentioned as well. And we just, we don't know who it was. We know he's 62 years old um, and that he's a part of the story. But it, again, the argument from those that are trying to disprove the book of Daniel is like, ha, there's this Darius the Mede. He's not mentioned in other kind of extant cuneiform uh, tablets. And therefore the book of Daniel must be um, thrown out. Whereas you, when you're like, hold on, you have all of this other evidence that's completely attested by the historical record. And, and as you mentioned, maybe just let the sands shift a little more. That's exactly what happened with uh, Belshazzar. And I think I am, uh, Sean, going to put in a request that you narrate you version in the Old Testament, because <laughs> you don't have any, the pastors that are listening to this may, may find this helpful. Uh, I talked to so many pastors, they'll like preach on uh, Genesis and you have all these ancient Kings that are mentioned or so many different parts of the Bible. Like, well, how, how did you know to, how to pronounce that word? It's like, well, I just listened to you version on audio uh, and uh, I just took however they pronounced it. So I, I think you could be a huge help to the body of Christ in correcting some of the yeah. the names in the old Testament, helping us pronounce them correctly. At least I, I have found that helpful. Um, So just, you know, back to Darius the Mede for a moment, we talked about how Ekpatana, the median capital hasn't been excavated. And the fact that, again, the fact that the Darius to me, we don't know exactly who he is, is, is again, not that knockout punch to the book of Daniel that critics try to make it. It's just the fact that we don't know exactly yet, but um, we've been in a similar place before. So as we uh, kind of move on here, I, I did want to ask you, because I've went through the whole series and we shared kind of seven key lessons uh, from the book of Daniel. But in addition to your teaching there in Hanover College, uh, very active in local churches in this area and have a ministry of your own. Uh, so what what are your thoughts? What are some of the, the major spiritual lessons that you take from Daniel and, and even just uh, the concept of the historicity and the reliability of the book of Daniel? What, what should we glean from this? It's a, uh, it's a broad question. It's an important question, though, I think, in this age in which we live. And, um, well, as briefly as possible, I'd say that the, some of the central themes of my own ministerial work are reflected here in this book. Um, and, and two of the uh, soapbox points, if you will, that I always try to stress in my own ministerial work is what a small amount of genuine faith can accomplish, right? Just just a, a tiny, tiny portion of genuine faith can accomplish so much. Your scripture tells us you can move mountains, and, and I believe metaphorically it can do so, and it has done so. And, it, and, and Daniel's message is one of what faith can do. Um, not only that, but the second uh, soapbox point, if you will, that I have is the power of persistent prayer. And one of the running themes, obviously, and it's something that uh, Daniel uh, is persecuted for. Um, and the power of persistent prayer is another wonderful theme and message there. I think that perhaps those two themes, along with the fact that Daniel ultimately is also about the supremacy of the one true God, the God whom we worship and serve, the sovereignty of our almighty God, the, the fact that Daniel harps on those and illustrates them so vividly and so strongly. I think this may be why Daniel is under attack. It has been for a couple of centuries, as we've mentioned now, and, and those attacks have been ramped up in our own day and age. And I don't think that's coincidence. I, I think, again, it's, it's an attack upon the possibility of the supernatural, the, the power of the prophetic. And it's interesting because some of these scholars who oppose the dating of Daniel to the 6th century BC are Christian scholars who will even use the argument, well, the, the prophecy is so precise and, 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 it's, and it's so, it comes to fruition so vividly here in the reign of these Seleucid kings that uh, it, it can't be authentic. It must be written after the fact with not with historical knowledge. 
And to those Christian scholars, I'd ask the question, well, what would you say about the messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament? Would you discard those as well if we're, if we're ready to throw out all biblical prophecy? I mean, you could be the strictest cessationist under the sun, uh, but biblical prophecy is something that is a hallmark of the Old Testament, and uh, Daniel seems to me to work within the same realm and in the same way, and therefore I, I do wonder aloud sometimes about the motives of trying to attack Daniel. Why is it that we're so reluctant in this case to take God's word at his word. And ultimately, I do think it, it is those messages. It's it's those powerful illustrations that have put Daniel uh, at the center of these attacks with a target on its back. That's so good. And and for those of you that may have been listening kind of for the first time and you're hearing all these linguistic arguments, like why in a, a podcast about citizenship are we talking about ancient Persian? Well, here's why. It's because the book of Daniel, again, it, to a secular society, to those that re- say God's word, you know, it's just uh, it's it's just history. It's it's not something written by God. It's just something created by man. Uh, the book of Daniel is something that I would would argue you have to wrestle with because if it was written in the sixth century, here again, just 135 prophecies in just one chapter, um, it, it is a a piece of literature that you would have to wrestle with if you're saying there is no God or there is no authority to Scripture. And I think, as you mentioned, that is why it's coming under such attack and also why we wanted to take some time to say, here, here's why you can trust this. And as we step into the public square, as we're talking with our coworkers and neighbors about the gospel, I do believe prophecy is one of those, again, links in the chain to say, here's why I believe scripture, here's why I am a Christian, and why I wanted to take some time to, to talk through it. Uh, so this is kind of the ultimate question I was thinking if, it was on, if I was in a case asking an expert witness for an opinion. Um, so if just to kind of summarize, uh, can we as Christians um, rest on a, a sixth century date and that what we find in the book of Daniel is prophecy and not just history? Yes, as we as we wrap up with that ultimate question, um, I'm not going to hedge my bets here, even though I am going to acknowledge that there are examples in the corpus of ancient literature of authors who were writing with a voice that is the voice of the past, right? They'll, they'll take on a, a persona, if you will, from centuries earlier. And this does exist within ancient literature. We have to admit that there are certain genres and subgenres in which this occurred. However, in the case of Daniel, on the basis of the linguistics, so the various languages that survive within the book, the history, the archaeology, on those bases, I, I will say that I have ascribed to the hypothesis that it is original, that it is a 6th century BC product, and that the arguments that have tried to downdate it have holes, sometimes small, that can be poked through, sometimes gaping holes, and, and I see no reason on the basis of those counterarguments to downdate Daniel to the second century BC. And I, I appreciate you kind of just saying, here, here's what I, I believe. As I've reviewed it, again, it just seems like all right, we there has to be some other explanation than that this is God's word. And so we will have to find something to explain this away. And again, some of the arguments about prophecy or uh, the theology being too advanced, they just seem, again, to be kind of... St- grasping at straws to say we have to disprove this in some way so we don't have to wrestle with the message of the book. And so that's certainly how I've kind of come to rest with these arguments. So uh, Sean, again, thank you for kind of walking us through that. I did want to tease uh, another podcast episode probably in the future. And because you've not only studied this era in history, but also have a specialty in uh, Roman history, especially kind of Roman Egypt, the Middle East. And as we have talked about Christian citizenship. And so many people go back to the New Testament and say, here's what Paul was doing, here's what Jesus was doing. But we often do that without any context of what government looked like at the time of Christ, uh, what the Roman state looked like, how things were done then. And so I I asked, uh, for listeners, I asked uh, Professor O'Neill, just maybe give us a bit of a teaser. Um, What are maybe one or two things that if you're looking at the New Testament saying, hey, here's a, a a fact that a lot of Christians don't know that we should know, and then we'll have to dive into that in more depth in the future. 
Sure, absolutely. I, I think if you're looking to the New Testament to um, discuss what power, earthly power and authority looked like at the time in the form of the Roman Empire, that there are all sorts of individual uh, persona, individual characters within the New Testament and and references to governmental, uh, I, I would say, appendages and uh, the phenomenon of political power that's chock-a-block full of uh, these these signs right within the New Testament, and I think that there are several characters. You know, when we have this larger podcast discussion, um, who are illustrative of some of these, reflective of some of these facts that most Christians might not recognize or realize. And so, for example, Paul, as you mentioned, Paul of Tarsus is a interesting example who will. Who, is instructive in many ways and unique in several other ways. I think we have something to learn from both Matthew and Zacchaeus, uh, who are well known, right? Not just the evangelist, but also this this wonderful uh, wee little man of children's song, who again I think is incredibly instructive in his own way. Um, I think we can learn a lot about the way Jesus in his own ministry uh, was received. I think that. That we can learn quite a bit from a figure like King Herod and understand what uh, the Jewish authorities, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what, what Jewish authorities were reacting against and operating within vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Roman government. Now, one of you, your readers might be wondering, how is it? Here's a little preview. How is it that you can have a king like Herod who exists within the framework of an empire that's supposed to be ruled by uh, a Senate and people, and by the time of the birth of Jesus, an emperor, an individual in whom all power is vested. How, how can you have kings in that sort of environment? And, and the answer comes down to Rome's allowance of what are called nowadays in scholarship client kingdoms, kingdoms that had special rights, a degree of autonomy, at least in terms of being free of certain taxes, sometimes all taxes, and of being free from the levy, the usual levy of troops, the, the requirement that provinces uh, supply troops in a draft to the Roman army for service, usually outside of their own home province. So the existence of client kingdoms is one of the interesting dynamics and phenomena that I would certainly talk about in that upcoming podcast. Um, the setting of Jews within the Roman Empire. If you're of the Jewish faith, well, you're obviously not someone who's going to worship the Roman gods and goddesses, because your very existence is defined by your complete faithfulness and devotion to a single God, the one true God, the God of Abraham. Uh, so how can they exist within this empire? Uh, was there any upward mobility for them? And the answer comes down to not just the existence of a client kingdom in Judea, but also of special independent rights that are granted within Jewish communities spread throughout the Mediterranean world. Um, there's a Greek term that's usually applied to that, a uh, polytuma. And these special rights that are granted to the Jewish community as it's spread throughout the Mediterranean world already in the first century, first centuries BC and AD, uh, is another interesting dynamic. How is it that somebody who is a Jew like Saul of Tarsus, later Paul, um, has Roman citizenship. How can that be possible? Uh, what role does uh, do the um, publicani, the tax collectors, have? And how can someone perhaps move themselves up in the Roman social hierarchy in that regard within this imperial framework? Well, again, we don't have enough time to talk about that here and now, but I'm, I'd be happy to come back at some later date and have that discussion with you. Looking forward to it. And so the first step in our kind of four step plan for gospel centered citizenship is to go over or review your role as citizen in light of scripture. And what I was convicted by as I was reviewing scripture for the book is that I had never really sat down and studied government structure in the New Testament. And we can fall into this trap of, of kind of foisting our current like political environment and even form of government onto the New Testament. And then making decisions about how we live uh, and how we live out our citizenship uh, based on a misunderstanding of the structure and the history. Uh, so I, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, 
you mentioned two things that I, I want to just highlight. One being the the client kingdom of King Herod, and you you even see the interplay between uh, Pontius Pilate, who's Rome's representative towards the south, and then King Herod uh, towards the north there, and they're playing off of one another. Uh, and then you see that continue into the book of Acts. And, and so that's really important as you're looking at Jesus' ministry, Paul's ministry. And then also I had completely missed the political authority of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and you have Jesus interacting with them. You have Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter interacting with them. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that future conversation. I think it's going to be really rich as we are trying to rightly divide the word of truth and apply it in our current uh, culture and our current citizenship here in the United States. So looking forward to that. Uh, so, Professor Neil, I just wanted to kind of give you the last word. Uh, we've, I've asked you a lot about the book of Daniel, ancient history. If you kind of had just on a, a billboard on which you could kind of summarize any thought for those in the Bible-believing church, um, any encouragement from what we talked about today, uh, what, what would you share with us? I suppose just one brief word of encouragement to, to know that in this world when so much is... Uh, uh, said about Christianity that really vilifies it ultimately, um, that everything needs to be secular. And, you know, there's certainly a, a time and a place for recognizing a division between church and state. But I think that phrase gets, sometimes gets uh, stretched, abused, uh, taken out of original context and purpose. And uh, I recognize its importance in many realms, but I also know that the, the attacks against Christianity, which certainly doesn't amount to full-scale persecution, we, we are quite privileged in many ways as Christians here in the United States of America, but at the same time, knowing that a Bible-believing believing Christian will, in certain quarters, even here in North America, be under attack, that it's, it's good to be prepared. I know that you have spent many many hours a great deal of time and effort toward that end right to help to prepare the folks who who read you who listen to you on the podcast etc and these are worthy efforts the word of encouragement that i have is simply remember that god's word is backed up in its essence much more often than snippets are ever uh, refuted uh, uh, successfully. Uh, in fact, it's overwhelming uh, the the amount of, of holy scripture that is confirmed, corroborated, and 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 that simply works within what we know of the cultural setting for not just Old Testament material, but especially uh, New Testament material that is um, never meant to be history, but that again reflects actual cultural developments, and genuine recognized history, even among secular scholars. That's all there. And so be encouraged. Uh, educate yourself. Read not uh, read the text of the scripture first and foremost, but read about the setting culturally, historically. And you'll find that you'll have quite a bit of ammunition for those who wish to attack you with, well, hey, this is supposed to be authentic, right? Well, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? What, what can you say against this challenge? And yes, there are parts of the Bible that uh, are in fact something that might be uh, historic, both in the way it presents itself and in the basic content. Well, again, there archaeology, history, language are almost invariably on your side. For those bits that are never meant to be historical, well, those challenges are, are equally easily dismissed. So take heart. Be, be educated, yes, but also re recognize that God's word, as you might expect, uh, defends itself successfully more often than not, and the challenges against it tend to fall flat again, as we might expect as Christians. Amen. And as this is kind of a postscript to our series on the Daniel Manual, uh, and I, I think about, I kind of joked at the beginning of the series that, well, things are getting, are they a little bit hotter perhaps than when you first heard this, these stories in Sunday school. And we, we're encouraging Christians to go out and say, here is God's word, and this is truth, and this is what we need in our society these days. It's it's so important for us to have that rock-solid belief in the authority of Scripture, 
And there's always, you know, criticism, people trying to get around what the Bible says. And so as, as we've had conversations over coffee, the conversation at our church, and even conversation today, and it just so encouraged me. I know it's going to be encouragement to our listeners as well. So Professor O'Neill, thank you for taking some time to be with us. And we look forward to future conversations, understanding kind of the history and governmental system uh, in scripture as we try to apply these things rightly in our time. So thanks again for taking some time to be with us. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. And I look forward to those future conversations.